Welcome to Talk of Christ, Faith, Family, and Adventure. I'm Steve Hunt, the consultant for Prosperity and Adventure, and I'm joined today by Joey Day, our guest, as we discuss the Trinity, uh, specifically a response to the Exploring Mormon Thought podcast with our friends, uh, Corey and Jacob um, Osler and their dad, Blake Osler, and they were discussing the Latin Trinity scripture and logic. And Joey, who is a believing evangelical Trinitarian, would like to discuss with me that podcast. And then I think in a future episode, Joey, uh, we may discuss it even more deeply with uh, Corey and Jake. Is that yeah. So go ahead. Uh, sure, why don't sure. you dive in and, and address your your thoughts and let's talk about it. OK, so uh, actually, it was Corey that asked me uh, what I thought of this podcast uh, in our back channel. We, we always mention our back channel um, and he was just asking me. And I think it was the question came after our or it might have been even leading up to our discussion about the in one of our recent videos, we talked about the, the CES letter, the um, uh, the fair Mormon response to the CES letter on the topic of the Trinity. Uh, and so Corey just kind of took a step back and was like, well, how, you know, how does it even work? You know, what do you think of, um, and I think specifically he was asking, you know, how do you resolve the logical contradiction uh, in the Trinity? Uh, and he pointed me to this episode of their podcast where uh, he, he and his brother Jake are interviewing their father, uh, Blake Osler, uh, about a chapter from his book. Um, so actually my response and I've, I've written, I've kind of outlined my response to the whole podcast. Um, I'd like to play a few clips from the podcast uh, and just kind of respond point by point to the podcast. But I think there's enough material in there that it may span a couple of episodes. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I would, I would welcome if, if Corey and Jake uh, would like, you know, to follow up and, and uh, respond to my response, I would definitely welcome a, a, a larger group video down the road. Um, I am going to play clips out of completely out of order. <laughs> so um, I don't know if that will be up. If you've listened to the, uh, maybe you pause this video, listen to the episode um, and you'll be ready to, to hear my, my clips and my response to those clips. Um, but uh, yeah, so a couple of things that I want to start with. Um, I, there's a couple of different things that Blake Osler says in this podcast that I really, really liked. And I want to touch on those first and just comment. Uh, oh, I'm being interrupted. You looking for something? <laughs> Sorry. I don't think it made its way back up here. <clears throat> uh, sorry about that. Um, so uh, I want to react to a couple of things that Blake Oster said that I really like first uh, before I before I dive into well, and actually in this video we may we might not get at all to some of his criticisms because um, there's some groundwork that needs to be laid first. But let me play these clips. So uh, these two clips I'm going to play are uh, Blake Oster's comments about the Council of Nicaea which I really appreciated. Um, so I'll, I'll play one of these and you tell me if you can hear it, Steve, hopefully this makes it into the video up with this. So I think you have to have a great deal of respect for what they're doing They're They recognize that there's a big problem and they're saying, well, look, let's bring our best scholars together to see if we can't come up with something that's workable as a solution. I mean, I have nothing but respect for that kind of thing. And so, you know, a lot of people disdain the councils because it's not a prophet receiving revelation, and it definitely is not. But Christians believe that these councils were guided by the Holy Spirit. And so what I call is second-class revelation. You know, these, these people were led by the Spirit, and they must have been inspired, but it's not really a revelation. It's just a formulation. And there are a lot of Christian churches that don't accept, for instance, the Council of Nicaea's resolution of the Arian Controversy. And so, you know, we have to be careful in recognizing that I think these people operated in, in good faith to try to do the best they could to resolve what they recognized was a very difficult logical problem to work through. Okay, so I, I really like his comments on that. You know, it's, um, it's really common for detractors of Trinitarian doctrine to, uh, to take like the low hanging fruit about the Council of Nicaea and, and, uh, you know, the, the common criticism is that, oh, it was it was just Constantine that puppeteered the whole thing for political expediency. You know, he he kind of forced the council to, to decide what he wanted them to decide. And 
Um, and Blake Osler takes the high road, you know, and just says, look, these were faithful men who were coming together to solve a problem. Um, and I think he's, I agree with him, obviously. I mean, I, you know, I'm a little biased, I suppose, toward, toward the idea that, yeah, these were faithful men. They were guided by the Holy Spirit. Um, yes, Constantine did convene the council and it was for political expediency. He needed a united uh, empire, you know. Um, but I, I think that all the people who were there, all the, the bishops, all the, you know, uh, the folks who actually sat down and deliberated on the decision, um, they, they wanted there to be a united church, right? And so the, their, their, uh, the motivations were aligned, right, with Constantine's motivation. And I don't think that Constantine unduly, you know, swayed the council one way or another toward what he wanted it to decide. Um, sure. <laughs> you, you know, to 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 understand no, that you I, have to go read a lot of history, and everyone who who writes the history is probably biased one way or the other. So, um, for the record, I mean, I that Blake Osler's position is what my own personal position has been on the councils and the Council of Nicaea. Uh, I just assumed that yeah, this is the gathering of mm -hmm. uh, faithful people who are trying to believe and trying to figure out um, what what it is they believe and they're doing the best that they can. And uh, it, it honestly hadn't even occurred to me that um, Constantine, I guess I haven't read enough to be aware of the criticism that Constantine might have been pulling the sure. strings and trying to lead it toward his own conclusions until you mm -hmm. mentioned it to me. And I was like, Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so anyway, Constantine actually um, there, there was a key moment in the, in the deliberations of the council where Constantine did speak up. And I think he did defend what became known as the Nicene position, the um, the Trinitarian position, but he was he was being counseled by um, one of the bishops that was there, who kind of fed him his lines, I think. Um, and actually, later, very shortly after the council, uh, Constantine took an Arian position, and he was basically an Arian for most of his life. Um, and uh, he was even, uh, I'm going to get the history wrong if I, but I believe he was baptized on deathbed by an Arian bishop. Um, so, yeah, so if you think that Constantine was the one pulling the strings, like, you know, you got to rec reckon with some of that, that history. But anyway, so I, I appreciate that Osler takes the high road. You know, he doesn't go after the low hanging fruit. He assumes good faith um, so and has some... respect for the Council of Nicaea. I like that. Yeah, we should probably um, express some uh, clarification for any of our Latter-day Saint watchers who aren't familiar with exactly what the um, Council of Nicaea would have been about, what they concluded, what the focus is real quick. What is this mm -hmm. Arianism? Uh, I guess there's some definitions, and we brought some of this up in our other videos, um, but mm -hmm. there are certainly, I, I assume there are people watching this you might yeah. not know what all that means okay well i mean that's a great segue into the next clip actually um and then we can we can kind of get into the meat of um of what trinitarianism even is because that that question is part of part of the the meat of of the of the the whole uh question so um but before i get that to that i do want to play one other clip too that a, a thing that i also really like from osler um he talks about um, the idea that the kind of knowing God that matters is not informational knowing, it's relational, interpersonal knowing. Um, and, I, and I really like that. I agree with him. And I, and I want to play this clip up front because I, I, want, I want the rest of our discussion to be colored by this clip. Oh, well, that's good. Uh, I think, I think this might have been what so. was uh, what occurred to me as, as something I wanted to bring up with you. And, and so it's interesting to me that you like it. Yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. Listen to that. Okay, uh, and I've got two clips there. Mm -hmm. One's 30 seconds long, one's 26 seconds long. It feels a little awkward just standing here staring at you while we're listening at the clip, but, <laughs> but here we go. However, if there's a requirement that human beings have to be able to understand who and what God is to be exalted or saved, then nobody will be exalted or saved because human beings just don't have that cognitive capacity. It's beyond us. But what is life eternal is to know God and the this is from John 17 and 3, but the knowledge that's required isn't knowledge about God. Not being able to define God accurately as a trinity, as Cardinal Ratzinger, later the Pope, would asserts, 
the kind of knowledge at issue is actually, and, and the verb there is, is ginosko. It's a form of interpersonal knowledge. It requires me to know the Father as the personal divine being and with whom I'm in relationship. Okay, and then, and then I think this is actually how he ends the whole podcast with this clip. So here's the reality, and I think this is really what Joseph Smith was hearing from God in the first vision. What he says is, you know, their creeds are an abomination. And why are they an abomination? He doesn't say it's because they, they make logical nonsense. He didn't say that. What he said is because their hearts are far from me, even though their lips are near to me. They're purporting to be near to me with their lips. But in reality, we don't grasp God with our lips or with our, you know, just with the noggins and, and our cognitive abilities. We grasp God only in the fullness of our being in our hearts in an exchange of interpersonal relationships. Okay. I misspoke. I don't think that's how the podcast ends. The it's podcast really ends with, with one last comment about, about the Nicene Creed uh, or the Nicene Council and how much respect he has for the people who did their best in that council. That's how he ends the podcast. But, but yeah, this is like one of the last thoughts that he has right at, toward the end. Um, and I really appreciate that thought, you know, and I, I like how he interprets, you know, um, the statements that Joseph Smith made about the creeds, you know, like he said there, uh, Joseph Smith didn't say the creeds were an abomination because they made no logical sense. Uh, he said that they were an abomination because they were, uh, you know, drawing people away from having a, a relationship with the true God. Um, and I, I would agree with that 100%. And so as we as we do dive into kind of the definition of the Trinity, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, I don't want it to feel dry or uh, just head knowledge, because I do think it's really important that we have um, that relational heart knowledge. Uh, and I do agree with him about how he interprets John 17, 3, that, that this is eternal life to know God. Um, I think that I agree with him. That means interpersonal relational knowing. Um, uh, but, uh, and we may not get into it today, but we'll get into it. Um, if we do one more video on this topic, uh, we'll get into, I do think that the Bible requires our faith in God to have certain content. Um, and so, um, so I would say it's a both and not an either or it's not either you have a relationship with God or, you know, certain facts about him. I think it's, I think both are required. Um, so anyway, I don't know if you want to <laughs> question well, I mean, me on that. Yeah, now, definitely or, uh, to, to identifying then what those specific facts are becomes important. I'm sure yeah. you'll get us yeah. to that. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and what heretical beliefs prevent, yeah, having that specific belief that yeah. you believe is required in, in, in God. Yeah. Okay. So, so now I want to get into the meat of kind of uh, what, what they discuss in the podcast. Um, they start, and, and this comes right out of his book. Um, so this is chapter six in, uh, in volume three of his Exploring Mormon Thought series. Yeah, I want to interrupt for just a second. I mean, we, just to go yeah. back to that question that I had a few minutes ago about, you know, what, and I, it, tell me if this is where you were headed with discussing, discussing this, but uh, yeah, what did the council at Nicaea de decide mm -hmm. in general? And uh, what was yeah. its purpose? And and who you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, m most Latter Day Saints uh, wouldn't have the first clue over even probably who Constantine was and why he called the council and anything like that. Right. So, any back history you want to drop sure. for us for a second would be helpful to those who are um, watching who don't know. Especially sure. those who so again the council you know, in our church. Yeah. It, we're, we're taught if we're taught anything about the Trinity uh, and you and I both agree that this is improper and incorrect. We're basically taught that those who believe in the Trinity believe in something that's completely unintelligible and uh, just unbelievable and lo a logical, yeah. complete logical fallacy. And that somehow then, then immediately following that, we tend to be taught that it's this idea that God is one being showing up in three different um, personas as in the modalism type uh, trend we're you know, we're taught most often yeah. in church that those Trinitarians believe that there's one God who sometimes shows up as God, the father, and sometimes shows up as Jesus Christ, the son. Uh, anyway, so we're just taught wrong because that is not 
Right. The, the common criticism from Latter Day Saints against the Trinity is to go straight to verses like Jesus' baptism or to uh, Jesus praying to the Father and say, "See, this is absurd. Why would Jesus pray to Himself?" And all of those arguments are really not arguments against uh, Trinitarianism as it's been classically defined. Those are arguments against uh, a heresy, uh, something that was declared a heresy in like the first or second century. It was really early on. Modalism and a Sibeli, there was a guy named Sibelius who wrote up and, and started teaching, you know, what I think is going on here is it's just one person, one God uh, who is pretending to be the father in the Old Testament. And then he pretends to be Jesus when he comes in the incarnation. And then and then the reason he has to leave is because then he comes back as the Holy Spirit. Right. And um, yeah, the, it's really easy to to poke holes in that. But, you know, you point to Jesus baptism, you point to Jesus praying to the father and you say, look, that's an absurd way of thinking about the Godhead. Um, right. It's it, and, and it, so there yeah, must they, be some real distinction between the persons or these verses in scripture don't make any sense. Um, and the, the so, yeah, that, that was knocked down saints, as a heresy. Sorry. Yeah. The realization that most Latter-day Saints need to make is that uh, those who believe in the Trinity, they read these verses in the Bible, too. They believe that that right. all three uh, divine persons were present at the baptism of Christ and that all three divine persons were present uh, when um, Paul, well, excuse me, when when Stephen was looking into into heaven yeah. and saw them. And mm -hmm. so they have to reconcile that. And, and the belief in the Trinity does not mean that there was one God who split himself into three persons when Stephen saw them in the heavens, you know, that it's right. yeah, anyway, just the realization right. that Those, Trinitarian, they are aware of these verses and, and their belief in the Trinity. Right. Makes not sense. only are we aware of them, uh, they are not difficult texts for me. In fact, uh, I would consider them as positive uh, yeah. biblical they evidence for your belief. Yeah, my belief in, in the Trinity. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, so the Council of Nicaea, another one of these heresies had popped up. There was a, a bishop uh, named Arius who, uh, who began to teach this idea that Jesus is not really uh, fully divine. He's not really uh, God or a God. Uh, but but that he was a creature created by God. Um, maybe he was a, a, an angel, you know, and maybe even he was the chief angel, right? Um, so he has a certain kind of prominence, but uh, he's not to be worshipped as God, right? And um, a, a number of bishops uh, heard that what he was teaching and, uh, uh, you know, they they knew that that was clearly wrong, you know, based on uh, the New Testament. Uh, I, I think it's very clear in the New Testament that Jesus is God. Uh, he's called God in a bunch of places. He's given all of the names and the titles of God. He does things that only God can do, um, you know, and so the Council of Nicaea convened to, uh, to sort of try to root out this heresy of Arianism. Well, ostensibly, they were getting together to like talk about, well, is Arianism the right way to believe or not, you know, and let's, let's consider the biblical evidence and, um, try to decide, you know, what the church should agree on as a, as a church body. Right. Um, so and this that, is because yeah. the old Testament had the Shema, the declaration that they bring up in, in the, the podcast right. that Jews believe and recite that here, O Israel, the Lord, thy God is one, right? Elohim. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, I mean, it, yeah, there's one God. Yeah. And, and, I, and I said in, in our last conversation, uh, and it's someone actually commented on, on our, our last YouTube video. Um, let me quickly pull up. Uh, I said in our last video that the Council of Nicaea, that everyone who convened at the Council of Nicaea already agreed on the creator-creature distinction. Uh, they all agreed that there was a sharp, uh, ontological qualitative difference between uh, God on one side of that divide and all created beings on the other side of that divide. Uh, and someone commented on our YouTube video and said, I don't, I kind of disagree with, with, uh, with his, um, I don't know, I, I forgetting exactly how he said it, but I uh, kind of agree with his summer, disagree with his summary of how the Nicene council. Um, and um, if you'll indulge me, um, 
I yeah. get that from a book um, that is called uh, Retrieving Nicaea, The Development and Meaning of Trinitarian Doctrine. Uh, and it's by a guy named Khaled Anatolios. Um, he said, he, he makes the claim in that book. And so if you're interested in researching that claim, um, I'm sure he lists his sources. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, I guess I'm not making that claim myself. I haven't done the primary research, um, that would be necessary for me to make that claim, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's definitely a question that's worth considering, you know, let's go check out the the primary sources and, and really kind of dive into, well, did everyone at the council so, already agree on the creator creature distinction or not? Um, would you say that there was did. a question going <laughs> into the council as to which side of that divide Jesus fell on? So I, I think that's exactly the question that was at issue. Yeah. Was which side of the creator creature divide does Jesus belong on? Does he belong on the creator side or does he belong on the creature side? Um, and to me, it's like, if that wasn't the question going in, then what was the question, <laughs> right? To me, like, I think both sides must have agreed that the creator creature distinction was a thing, you know, and then what they went into the council to try to decide was, where does Jesus fit? Is Jesus and the, on the God side or is he on the creature side? And the problem was that if he was on the God side, then did that make two gods? Did that disagree with the Shema saying there's only one God? Or right. did, uh, yeah. if he was on the creature side, did that mean that he was not divine as the son of God? Right. So, and, and then the, right. the struggle and what they were attempting then to decide was how is it that he, and what they eventually decided was that he falls fully on, get, correct me if I'm wrong, but fully on both sides, Jesus does. He's fully divine. Yeah. He's also yeah. fully man. Uh, and yeah. he is at the same time, he does not create an additional God. He is the one God with God, the father. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this is where the, the, the confusion and understanding, I mean, it's, it's just simply saying, well, it must be that he is fully man and he is fully God, but right. that does not right. make two gods right. or three. It makes right. one. Yeah. And, and the Council of Nicaea honestly did not settle nearly half of the questions that you just listed. Um, they, they basically struck down Arianism as a heresy. They said, no, Jesus is not a creature. He's not a created being. He is clearly on the God side of the creator-creature distinction. Um, when you said a second ago that Jesus is on both sides, um, that he's fully God and fully man, that actually wasn't, uh, wasn't hashed out until a later council. Uh, and that was, uh, again, in response to another heresy, the heresy of Nestorianism. Um, they hashed out the, what is called the, I'm sorry, I'm using way too many, uh, uh, vocabulary terms, but they hashed out what they, what they called the hypostatic union, which is the, which is the, uh, the doctrine that Christ is one person in two natures. So he is fully God and fully man. They actually did not hash any of that out at the council of Nicaea. Oh. At the Council um, of Nicaea, they basically just arrived at he is on the God side, but it does not create two yeah. gods. And, and uh, you know, you could also even see Nicaea as, as uh, coming away with a form of like binitarianism, because they didn't really talk about the Holy Spirit much at all in the Council of Nicaea. That was also settled a little bit later, the, the full divinity of the, the Holy Spirit. So this was an ongoing, you know, this was one step along the, the path of forming a full, fully orbed, you know, Trinitarian doctrine. Um, and the, the creed that came out of the Council of Nicaea was actually amended and changed. So the Nicene Creed that you know of today is probably the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, which was actually written about 150 years later in the Constantinopolitan Council. So this gets really complicated <laughs> and I, Hadn't intended to go into all that history in this video, but it's good no, it's, that you're asking the question because probably a lot of other people would have asked the question. So, so the Council of Nicaea was a stepping stone along the way uh, toward, you know, the fuller uh, expression of the doctrine that came. I, I guess sort this, of step by step. This leads to one question of of why do you feel these councils were necessary? Why wasn't this doctrine clearer from the New Testament itself? Mm -hmm. Uh, the teachings of Paul or whatever, why, yeah, why, why did, why was, was there so much disagreement on this topic? 
Um, that's a good question. Um, it's um, because I do believe that it's clear in scripture uh, that these things are all taught. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I can't get inside of Arius's head. I can't get inside of Sibelius's head. I can't get inside of, um, you know, I think that the, the, the ones who rose up with these specific heresies, uh, they were just being sloppy. You know, they, they, they latched onto a couple of proof texts and ignored a bunch of the rest of scripture and came out with this new idea that they had about, well, I think it fits together like this. Um, the, the, I mean, the, the reason, and the reason why people would try to do that is because um, there is there is a paradox, you know, at the at the very heart of God's nature. God is not like us, you know, and trying to fit him into fit him into a mold, you know, uh, to, you know, to understand him, to wrap our brains fully around his nature and, and who and what he is. Um, it's we can't do it as finite creatures. And, but the but the but the temptation, the pull, you know, to just, oh, I'm, I'm going to figure it out, you know is so strong that, that people, you know, try to figure it out and they come out with their idea. And, um, almost as soon as you think you've got it figured out, it turns out that you're probably contradicting some whole other swath of scripture that you either didn't consider, or you forgot about, or you swept under the rug or something. Right. Um, Sibelius was clearly, you know, ignoring a whole, swath a whole slew of verses that that show the son very clearly talking to the father as if they're two different persons right he just sort of swept all that under the rug and just said ah, i'm just kind of going to ignore all of that you know when i come up with my doctrine of god um and arius did the same thing he swept under the rug all these verses that that seemed to me very definitively and clearly to show that jesus is god um uh and so you know and and the same is true for i could list off more the the very heresies that are identified um and so what happens is trinitarianism starts out as this kind of nebulous thing that like well there's these five or six things that we're pretty sure we have to believe about god um and then as the various heresies sprung up they were chipping away at the definition you know to where um the trinity trinitarian doctrine is almost defined um more in terms of what it isn't than in terms of what it is we know that that modalism is not Trinitarianism. Trinitarianism is, is not modalism. And we know that it's not Arianism, right? And, and so, and we know that it's not... Um, now, now, really quickly, those, those two things, or, aren't, aren't they essentially you know, the same thing, you know. modalism and Arianism, just for, for definition sake here? When you say Arianism and you say modalism, it's the same heresy that... Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, no, no, no. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Modalism is Sibelianism. Yeah, I just want right. to. I want to be yeah. clear. I want to make yeah, sure I'm it. getting it. I want to make sure anybody yeah. watching is getting it. My bad on that. I did not mean to. Arianism. Right. Then Arianism is is the idea that uh, Jesus Christ is uh, not divine. That he is a created son of God, human, essentially a great right. creature. And uh, meanwhile, Sabellianism, right. aka modalism, is that Jesus and God are one, uh, just showing up in different formats and and one God. Okay. one person yeah one person. they're they're one they're person. one person and 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 this is yeah. something that that we've had to that i've had to come to grips with and and is that that there's a very specific use here of the word being and of the word person uh or persona yeah. or whatever that um when you say god is one you are saying that in with in the trinitarian belief that god the father jesus christ the son and the holy ghost are one being which you i think would say equals still one in substance and essence and several other Mm -hmm. ways that they are one Mm -hmm. being but you won't call them one person uh they are three separate persons um which is how they appear in in you know, relationship to each other and, and, and to us, yeah. which then of course becomes confusing to me because in any uh, general use of the terms being and person for a human being and a human person, those are identical right. words. Yeah. Okay. Right. We don't have any experience of a, of a, of a single being that, that has multiple persons. Um, well, but, I mean, but maybe I, a schizophrenic 
person is that uh yeah there's there's bad examples that i would not use uh as <laughs> as analogies for the being of god um but uh yeah, no, and that's a topic I'm going to get into a little more uh, later on, because that's one of the main criticisms that Osler has of Trinitarian doctrine is just that it's a bald faced contradiction. Um, and so I want to talk more about how we resolve that contradiction as well. But but everything we've been discussing is a good segue, I think, into the next clip I want to play. And maybe this clip will kind of illuminate uh, or maybe even just summarize what kind of what we've already been saying. So let me play this next clip. Um, so actually, uh, in this clip, Osler is responding to a question that I think Corey asked him, and Corey read from the book, and he read out this syllogism that has four premises, uh, and this is from the book, this syllogism that, uh, and, and he presents it in the book as this is the logical problem of the Trinity, right? There's these four premises that, that, uh, that uh, traditional Christianity uh, very clearly wants to accept, these four propositions, right? Number one, uh, premise number one, the one true God is exactly one divine individual, Yahweh. Premise number two, the Father is God. Premise number three, the Son is God. And premise number four, the Son is not identical with the Father. Okay, that's the sort of the little logical, uh, the four premises in this little syllogism that he quotes from the book. And then let me play this clip of Osler kind of reacting to that. You just said that they were. This is a logically inconsistent tetrad. In, the, in other words, acceptance of any three of these propositions entails the logical denial of the fourth, and yet all four propositions that Christians were clearly committed to. So if you accept that the Father is God and the Son is God, and that there's only one God, you accept Sabellianism or modalism. The Father and the Son have to be the same person or identical. If you accept that the Father is God but the Son isn't God, then you reject Jesus as being divine. The Jews did that, but. Oh. My clip started playing, or stopped playing. You just Sorry, they were. I don't know. This how to is skip a logically forward. inconsistent tetrad. In, the, in other words, oh, like, acceptance of any three of these I don't propositions have a slider on the... entails the logical denial of the fourth. And yet, all four propositions that Christians were clearly committed to. So if you accept that the Father is God and the Son is God and that there's only one God, you accept Sabellianism or modalism. The Father and the Son have to be the same person or identical. If you accept that the Father is God but the Son isn't God, then you reject Jesus as being divine. The Jews did that, but that's a form of Arianism, and at least that's what the more traditional Christians have argued. If you accept that the Son is God and that there's only one God, and that the Son is not identical to the Father, then you have to deny that the Father is God. And as strange as it seems, there were Gnostics during the first and second century that viewed the God of the Old Testament as not truly God, because that God was evil, the kind of things that God did are just not acceptable. But the loving God expressed in Jesus is the true God. And so you had Christian Gnostics who essentially rejected the divinity or reality of the Father. And so the point is, is that the acceptance of any three logically entails the denial of the fourth, and yet traditional Christianity very clearly wants to accept all four propositions as bedrock doctrine that can't be rejected. Okay, so did that, I don't know if that cleared anything up for you. Yeah, no, let um, me, can I share my screen now here? I uh, want to share. Yeah, I was going to share, do you have, did you write down the I wrote them down, yeah, did you do that too? Do you, it's up okay. to you. Okay, yeah, go for it. No, go for it. All right, so. Uh, yeah. These are the four, right? There is one true God. Okay, the so, Father. so Go ahead. right. And he writes it as as the one true God is exactly one divine individual, Yahweh. Now, meaning Blake Osler writes it that way, or who is it that Osler writes it that way? Osler writes it that way. So um actually, yeah. So part of what I want to do is kind of um push back a little bit on the way he writes the syllogism because I wouldn't write it the same way that he writes it. But um, yeah, the father's God, the son is God and the son is not identical with the father. Yeah. And then he yeah. says that if you believe yeah. the first three, then you must conclude that the one true God is the modalist uh, Sibelian right. uh, one God that is the father and the son are the same being the same, excuse me, person. Okay. And the same uh, being and the same person. They're the same yes. 100%. No distinction okay. between them. They just, they just are identical. The father but is it, the son. The son is the father. 
And if you and, believe that the father is God, the one true God, and is not identical with the son, the third one here, then you conclude that the son, then, then you conclude the son is not God. And yep. that is and that's Arianism. Arianism. Okay. Or if you don't want to, if you don't want to name it after a man, you could call it subordinationism. Um, All right. The idea that the son is subordinate to the father, that he's a creature of the father, not, not. And uh, if you believe not that there is one, with the one God, if you believe there's one true God and the son is God and the son is not identical with the father, well then somehow the father is not God. And, right. he, and he has to called, kind of dig deep to find anybody who actually believes that he has to point out some ancient like Gnostic believers who uh, who rejected the God of the Old Testament. They thought the God of the Old Testament was evil and the God, the good God was Jesus. Um, and, uh, and then. I think it's interesting. He has to dig deep to find those people. Uh, Cause I don't, I don't know that there's anybody today who believes that, but. So then the last. Position... And the one he, the one he missed, he actually in the, he doesn't mention in the book, he gets all four. Uh, but speaking off the cuff in the podcast, he just left one out. I think accidentally. Uh, the one he missed one? is if you, if you. Yeah, that's this one. If you, if you yeah. believe the father's God and the son is God and the son is not identical with the father. Uh, then but, it's, uh, you, but you sort of skip over or ignore tritheism. all of the scriptures that say God is one. Yeah, you end up with a kind of tritheism or polytheism, right? Polytheism. Where oh, there's two gods. There the father, there's gods. God the Father yeah, and there's God the Son. They're two different gods. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so, so then those are the positions you end up with if you pick any three of them. But when you try to pick all four, mm -hmm. he, he says it's just a contradiction. He says it's just an outright contradiction. Yeah. And in, in the book, he he shows his own cards in the book and he says that he thinks that premise number three needs to be uh, qualified. Um, and he and he to his credit, he says, you know, we need to find a way to qualify it in such a way that it's still faithful to the, the scriptural record. And, you know, premise um, number three of he doesn't is God. Yeah. And I don't know why he takes that. So and I, and I don't want to. Um, I don't want to be into his mouth what he himself believes because in various places I've seen himself kind of identify his own understanding with, with social Trinitarianism, which I would say would be closer to the tritheist uh, position yeah, of, that seem of to be... affirming the last three and denying the yeah, first one. Doesn't, doesn't it seem to be, yeah, exactly that, that he's taking the, he's affirming the last three. And so he would qualify the first statement. And I, I, I he think wants that, to qualify. He, I think here's, that here's most how I think. think it would qualify this first statement of there is one true God, one divine individual Yahweh and would qualify that and say there is one true and probably just say there's one true God head, one true organization of, of yeah. God yeah. as one, you know, unified group. Anyway. Yeah. I think he's operating on the, so when I say the son is God, I mean that the son is consubstantial with God, that the son is the same uh, the same substance or essence as as the one God, and I think that's what he wants to qualify. He wants to say, no, no, I think the Son is divine. He's God in some sense, but not in the sense that he's identical with God or consubstantial or, um, you know, does that make sense? That's what he wants to qualify. I think. Yeah, it's, um, it surprises me that that is. Uh, I, I I I'm not sure that I heard that when just listening to the podcast. Um, but, uh, because mm -hmm. I, like I say, I'm more, inclined. no, and he says that in the book. That's a, that's a quote I'm pulling from the book. I okay. don't think he said that in the podcast. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so in the podcast, he says, uh, he says, uh, traditional Christianity very clearly wants to accept all four propositions as bedrock doctrine. Um, but, but actually in the book, he goes a little further saying that, um, all of which are quite clearly affirmed in scripture. Um, and what I wanted to do, and, and this may be how we'll wrap up, this might be the last, what we have time for. Um, I want to uh, go to the scriptures and point out like, okay, so he has these four propositions. And actually, um, before I do that, I would add a few more propositions. I would, I would have to add the Holy Spirit is God, right? And, and he knows this, he says as much in the chapter when he builds this little syllogism, these propositions, um, he knows that it's not the complete definition of Trinitarianism. What he's, what he's trying to do though, is kind of um, uh, boil it down to the essence the, the most and simple, show that, you know, all you need, yeah, all you need are these four and, and you've got a contradiction. Contradiction, exactly. So, right. 
Um, so I would add a few more propositions. The, the Holy Spirit is God. Um, I would even add um, things like the, the persons mutually indwell one another. Um, and I would add uh, that they are distinguished by their relations of origin, uh, personal properties. Um, there's a few more things I would add to the, the fully orbed definition of the Trinity. I might even add, we spoke a little bit, bit ago about the hypostatic union that, that Jesus is uh, one person in two natures. I might even go down that, that path and say that's part of is the it, definition of the Trinity. Um, is it safe hmm? to say, though, as you add some of those other things, you know, as you say the Holy Ghost is God and they indwell e e each other and they are differentiated by their origin uh say that one more time the way you said it because i said it wrong they're differentiated by um personal properties uh or uh most of the time we would call those personal properties uh relations of origin okay um it it seems to now this is this is my bias standing out and, and what i've already revealed that it feels like the the one that needs to be tweaked is the first one the one god uh, the Shema yeah, just yeah. is misunderstood in what it means that there is one God. Mm -hmm. It feels to me that by simply tweaking that one premise that there is one true God, the single individual Yahweh, that mm -hmm. uh, that by tweaking that one premise, all the other premises that you've just said that you can find in scripture fit just fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't right. tweak that one and you go to tweak some of the others, um, you have to tweak multiple of them to make it work. It seems like if you're going to go ahead and tweak mm. uh, the way in which Jesus is God, you also will have to tweak the way in which the Holy Ghost is God to make it work so that they are, uh, right. you know, so anyway, I, it just seems like the easiest solution is to say, we must be misunderstanding this one God idea. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I disagree. <laughs> but I, but in order to explain to you what, why I think that that first premise is important, I would have to, I would have to go pretty far down a rabbit hole of explaining uh, the doctrine of divine simplicity. You know, is a big one, uh, which which is wrapped up in a bunch of other of what we call the attributes of God. And that's the um, one thing that so, God is not can't be separated into different parts. And right. You know, so yeah, we can't have a part. Yeah, I mean, you know, so the, the classic formulation, which is much maligned by Latter Day Saints, is the idea that God is without body parts or passions, right? Uh, that actually comes from a number of the um, the the uh, confessions that came out of the the Reformation. Um, the confession that that uh, my church uh, holds in our confessional documents, uh, the Westminster Confession, has that phrase in it, uh, without body parts and passions, and the simplest. Um, sort of most, uh, most um, simplistic way of saying that is God doesn't have a body, right? He doesn't have arms and legs. He doesn't have fingers and toes. But, but when we say that God is without parts, we mean a lot more than just that. Uh, we mean that there is no composition in God. Um, and so I, I don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole, but um, we're denying things like um, uh, uh, the big one is like act versus potency, right? Right now I'm speaking, right? I'm acting, I'm doing something, I'm speaking to you, I'm waving my hands around uh, like an idiot. Um, but I'm also sitting on my butt in a chair, right? I, I could be, there's, there's potential energy stored up in all my muscles. I could be swimming, I could be playing Beat Saber, I could be doing something else right now. And so there's potential in me to be doing something other than what I'm doing currently, right? Uh, so there's, there's, there's composition in me between my actions and my potentiality, right? We could talk about other kinds of potential in me, right? I don't have a PhD. I could get a PhD. I think I could. Um, I haven't yet. I, I don't honestly don't have any interest in getting one, right? But that potential exists in me, right? I could actualize that potential if I chose to, right? And when we say that there's no composition in God, we are denying things like in God, there is not act and potency there is only act god is pure act there's no potential in god to for him to grow he's just pure act right um so that's a denial of of eternal progression we could go down that whole rabbit hole yeah, no, but and very quickly um, why is that important why is that a necessary belief at, that leads to this idea of no uh parts um well the way I just described it is a very philosoph philosophical way of describing it. This comes from uh, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, uh, very prominent Catholic theologian uh, during the Middle Ages. Um, 
but I think that that doctrine is found in scripture. Uh, you know, it's, it, I think it's taught there. Um, and so, you know, when scripture says that God does not change, uh, it says that Jesus is the same yesterday, uh, today and forever. Um, there, there is no potential for God to change. He doesn't change. He just is what he is, right? It's bound up in his name. He, he says to Moses in the burning bush, I am what I am, right? He just is what he is. He doesn't change. He just, he is, right? So he's pure act. He's, there's no potency in God. It's a very philosophical way of describing it, but I think it's there in scripture. It's taught in scripture. And from that idea, uh, when we talk about the oneness of God, well, from that idea, and there's five or six other kinds of composition that are denied. Um, I could explain them all. Things like genus and species, uh, form and matter, uh, supposit and nature. There, Aquinas had a bunch of categories where he said this kind of composition, though it exists in creatures, it does not exist in God. And here's where it's it's shown, demonstrated to us in scripture, right? So the Shema by itself, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, that isn't the only place we go to, to get this doctrine of simplicity from. Um, it comes from a lot more places and it's harder to reinterpret all of those taken as a whole uh, in the way that you're wanting to reinterpret it. Um, that's a very short answer to that question. Uh, I, did, I probably didn't really do the answer justice, um, but... Uh, no, I mean, that explains why you feel like that's, you know, it's, it's hard to mm -hmm. tweak that particular one. Yeah. So, uh, so what I want to do, though, is kind of just a quick overview of where, you know, Osler says that all these, these uh, premises, these propositions are, are clearly affirmed in scripture. And so I want to just kind of go through where they're affirmed and how they're affirmed in scripture. So we've already talked about um, his first premise. Yeah, I can share them uh, as you read them. Uh, how, how many verses do you sure. end up having? Oh, about a dozen, maybe, all, all told. And I'm really only going to read um, half of them, probably, and just mention a few of the others. Uh, well, but yeah, if you want to pull up. Yeah, I'll pull up the ones so, that you decide you want to read. Yeah, the, the one, the one that, that, that we've already discussed is the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verses 4 and 5. This would probably be the uh, the uh, focal text for for this first premise that there's that God now, Yahweh is one individual. I I mean I I I, I personally uh, believe that it's worthwhile to read, uh, especially challenging passages of scripture, uh, but biblical scripture from you know newer. Uh, translations and interpretations just to see if we can better understand what they mean. Uh, however, as, uh, assuming that they're not too complicated reading from the King James Version, do you mind if we use that version right now? Yeah, I don't mind. I don't mind at all. Nope. So, so I mean, this is the classic text that, uh, that uh, Jews recite this text. Uh, they keep it uh, written on a, on a piece of paper in a little box that they tie uh, onto their wrist um, and so this is a, a very important text for Jews. Um, and it's verses uh, four and five here. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Um, and this is, uh, this is the text that Jesus quotes in the Gospel of Mark. Um, and so, uh, you know, Jesus evidently, and this is the first great commandment, right? Um, love, love the Lord, your God. And then the second commandment, love your neighbor. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so the first great commandment is that the Lord, our God is one Lord. Now I, I put in here that the Hebrew words would have been, you know, mm -hmm. Yahweh, our Elohim is one Yahweh. Right. Okay. Right. Or Jehovah. And that's important to Power. point out for anyone who Power. would take a simplistic view of, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the LDS church, it's common to attribute the name Jehovah or Yahweh to Jesus and the name, the name or title Elohim to the father. Um, and that's a convention. Uh, I think you, and I agree on that. Like you can point to the documents in the early 1900s where one of the president of the church came out and kind of stated that, look, as a general convention, we're going to start using Elohim and Jehovah in this way. Um, but, but those aren't, you know, Jehovah is not the personal name of the son and Elohim is not the personal name of the father. Those are just sort of con by convention, 
it's used that way in the LDS church, but you can find, and this is one verse among thousands that you can find in the old Testament where the words Elohim and Yahweh are used kind of interchangeably of the yeah, one God, the one, right? The one true God. Okay. And so if Jesus says, this is the first great commandment to recognize and to, you know, to remember and believe in and to love the Lord, thy God, the one true God with mm -hmm. all your heart, mind, mind, and strength, then yeah, it becomes a challenge to tweak anything that might suggest that there are multiple gods right. or that there are, right. um, yeah, or, or otherwise to, to, yeah, to, to tweak that idea. The, the, of course, right. you have the Hebrew <clears throat> just reality that Elohim ends in a Hebrew plural im, so Elohim is a plural. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, but so, correct me if I'm wrong, though. Whenever they speak of Elohim in the Old Testament, they use uh, singular verbs and, and pronouns and stuff, don't they? I the word Elohim probably, is a right. plural word, but it's used in a weird, weird grammatical way. Um, it's used yeah. to represent a singular subject. Uh, and so could that so be it, like, it, it, you know, the queen in always English. refers to herself as we. Uh, yeah, we would like to go see the countryside today. You know, the, the royal we, right? Is it or a we it, of majesty? Is it a is it a we of like uh, emphasis or um, God is so great that that we refer to him by a plural uh, noun? Um, I think there's yeah, something like that like in Hebrew the, the, that they the different word endings will give it give a word more emphasis or more oomph, and that, and that could be why Elohim is pluralized. Um, or just because of how great and how, uh, yeah, unlimited. And yeah, but the, the, the phrase, you're right, the, the grammar right. comes across something more like, and the gods says, let's make a world. And the gods yeah. uh, creates the world. And you're like, wait. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right. Okay, so. So I, I would say that that is a definite um, sort of hint in the Old Testament of the triune nature of God, but but you can't hang a, tri a doctrine of the Trinity on on those Old Testament passages because there's other ways of interpreting it. Um, I mean, take it in context. So other places I would Old point Testament to context. This was coming to a people who were living amongst people who believed in polytheism, all kinds of gods living on mm -hmm. mountains or gods of the plains and gods of the hills and gods of the rivers and gods of the stars. And this message delivered to them at the time was Israel here, one God. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and, and for sure it would be contradicted by God later coming out and saying, well, actually there's three of us. Um, right. So uh, yeah, there's got to, this right. definitely has to take its place <clears throat> in defining who is God and yeah. why is there only one God. And yet, like you, like you say, one being and three persons anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's so I would point to, and I won't read these, but just skim over them quickly. Uh, Galatians 3.20 is another place that says this is the first, God is one. James 2.19 uses the phrase God is one. Um, you could go thousands of other places. The, the Isaiah is somewhere in the 40s and 50s in Isaiah. God makes several statements, you know, uh, to the effect that I am the only God. I know of no other God besides me. Um, you know, who, who are you going to compare me to? Look around. There's no one else. You know, I'm the only God. Um, and so I think you have to reckon with all of those passages and ask, you know, well, if Jesus is another, a second God aside, aside from the father, how do you reconcile that with all these other passages? Right? So that's the first premise. There's only one God. Um, do I have to prove the second premise to you that the father is God? Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I necessarily even have to demonstrate. And like I, I, I was saying, I Osler has to really dig deep to find anybody who really believes that. Um, because I think this is the yeah. easiest one to demonstrate from scripture. Yeah, I think that. Uh, I think well, anyone we that believes that and, the Father's not God. Yeah. Yeah, we don't need to go and open up the scripture and read it here. Uh, but everybody can, you know, be reminded of the verses where Jesus is saying, I ascend to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. And. That's you exactly know, I, the one I had set aside. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and he prays to the father. John chapter and, 20, verse 17. Yeah. Right. I, I think everybody who's uh, watching this will be able to easily uh, support the premise that God, the father is God. So let's. I think so too. So let's move on to premise three, that the son is God. Uh, and so I would go to a place like Romans chapter nine, verse five. Um 
Okay. Uh, Romans chapter nine, verse five, and this is kind of mentioned in passing. We'd have to read the whole thing in in context to uh, because um, it's like in in the middle of a sentence. Um, well, starting at verse three, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. He's lamenting the fact that the Jews have not accepted Christ as their savior. Uh, and he's saying, you know, I, if, if, if I could trade myself for them, you know, I, I would wish that myself was accursed uh, if, if they could accept this, you know, um, uh, Whose are the fathers and of whom, is, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Um, and to me, this is this is calling Christ God. He, Christ is God blessed forever. Yeah, that, that feels like you would need to take a, a little bit of a look at the at the uh, Greek behind it to see if yeah. he's saying God blessed him forever. He's God blessed or whether he is God. Right. Interestingly, right. is there is there another one you want to look up that more clearly states that uh, Christ is First Timothy, uh, First Timothy, no, excuse me, Titus, Titus two thirteen, not First well, Titus. Gonna, There's only one Titus. On, uh, Titus two thirteen. There you go. What's interesting while this is pulling up is that we have many, many clear statements in the Book of Mormon and in the Doctrine and Covenants that say that Jesus Christ is God. So uh, Latter-day mm -hmm. Saints should believe this. Uh, but also, interestingly, I think right. many Latter-day Saints, if you ask them who is God, they would most likely answer that God the Father is God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they would right. you have to press them a little bit to realize and understand that their scriptures very clearly state that actually Jesus Christ is God. Um, right. But anyway, right. let's let's look at uh, you said verse 13. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, right. And again, this is about the Greek sort of grammatical, like we're not talking about two people, you know, God and Jesus Christ in the Greek grammatically, this is. God and Savior are two different titles that are given to Christ right. grammatically. And I, I saw it right um, away that, that, that this is calling Jesus Christ our the great God and our Savior. But uh, then you you muddied the water for me yeah. <laughs> by saying that, yeah, this Sorry. could be seen as two different people. And I see that. Uh -huh. Right. What he's looking forward to is the second coming of Christ. Right. And that will be the glorious appearing of the great God, um, Jesus Christ. Right. Um, first Peter one, one is another place I would go to. We don't have to read it, but it's another similar, uh, it talks about our God and savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and again, here I could go thousands of other places, right? There's all sorts of inferences. There's things like places where in the old Testament, God says, I alone created all things. And then you see in the new Testament, these very clear statements that actually it was Jesus that created a bunch of stuff, you know? Uh, or places where in the Old Testament, God says, I alone will judge. And then you find in the New Testament that Christ is going to be the judge, right? right. Um, I don't think I have to belabor the point too much because I think a lot of Latter-day Saints will agree with me 100%. I mean, you attribute the name Jehovah to Christ and you say that Jesus was the God of the Old Testament, right? That um, So Jesus we, is Yahweh, right? It should be very clear. It, yeah, it, it, Jesus also says, you know, that before Abraham was, I am indicating that he himself is the great I am right. and the God of the Old Testament. So yeah, we right. we say that all the time in uh, in church. Again, we're more likely to say God the Father is God, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but we also very clearly and often will state in church, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. That means he's God. Right. <laughs> so, okay, right. so we'll support um, uh, and so far. So, so I guess what I'm Maybe backing up a little bit. Go ahead. I, sorry. I, no, I was just going to say with these three, we've done three of the premises so far. And it's very clear, as you've pointed out, that scripture says that there is one God. And uh, it would not make sense to at some later point say, actually, there are three or multiple gods. It's also very clear right. that God, the father is God. We, we just accept that. And Jesus said that. And it's very clear that Jesus is God. And so now, yeah, if we 
just simply accept these first three statements, we're inclined then to mm-hmm. say, okay, then God the Father, it, logically, if there's one God, God the Father's God, Jesus is God, then right. we're logically inclined to say, oh, they must be the same uh, person. And I know that right. your conclusion is, well, they are the same being, right. not the same person, which then we get this, what right. does that mean? Yeah. Okay, so what's well, the point? So, so what I was, was going to do next, and, and maybe backing up a little bit, um, I don't think Latter Saint, Latter-day Saints will have any problem identifying Jesus as Jehovah or Yahweh. Um, the question is, can the Father be identified as Jehovah or Yahweh? And I think that he can very clearly. It, you don't have to go very far. Um, but one, one interesting way that I've found um, is the way that the New Testament authors quote the Old Testament. Uh, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have the divine name anywhere in the New Testament. They didn't, they didn't put the name Yahweh or Jehovah anywhere in the Greek scriptures. Um, and they followed, they followed the, uh, the Septuagint, which was the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, in using the word Kyrios or Lord, the Greek word for Lord. Um, the but they word attributed Adonai. that word Lord to Jesus all over the place. Yeah. Uh, you find quotes like, uh, in Acts, uh, uh, Luke quotes from Joel, a verse that uh, is about calling on the name of the Lord. And in Joel, it's very clearly calling on the name of Yahweh, right? But, but in Acts, he attributes that to Christ, uh, that Christ is the Lord and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? So there's a clear identification. And I don't think Luke, you know, made a mistake. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. He was calling Jesus Yahweh by using that Old Testament passage in that way. And um, I don't, I don't have any in front of me right now, but you can do the same thing. You can find places where the New Testament writer is clearly talking about the Father, God the Father, but he, excuse me, but he quotes an Old Testament passage that is that is about Yahweh, right? Yahweh is speaking, and he quotes that and says, you know, God the Father says this, right? Um, so you can, I think, demonstrate pretty clearly that not only yeah, is Jesus share one of those identified one as of those Yahweh. Verses? Um, I could get one quickly. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, they're not hard to find. There's more of them than there are for Jesus, I think. Um, uh, uh, here's one. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah or Hosea, Hosea chapter 11, verse one. So Hosea is going to be an Old Testament verse then. Mm-hmm. And you're saying that we're going to find that this is uh, a, a reference to Yahweh and it means the father. It most definitely does not mean the son. I don't know what you just tried to say. <laughs> it sounded, it sounded, uh, it sounded like a contradiction the way you just put it. No, that's fine. Okay. So let's, let me share this here. What I, I guess I'm getting at is again, that you, we're looking for a verse that very clearly says that again, because Latter-day Saints are inclined because of conventions to see Jesus as Yahweh or Jehovah, right. uh, that we're looking for a verse that very clearly says that actually right. the father can also be called, uh, Jehovah. Uh, identified with so, the one God, Jehovah, Yahweh. Yeah. yeah. So here, because again, that, that Shema that we read earlier from Deuteronomy says that Jehovah, Yahweh is the one God, Elohim. And so now yeah. we're looking at Hosea 11, which this is from the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> right. And, so, and this may not be ahead. a super good example because the name, the, the uh, well, uh, it's not until I think verse 10 where you see the small caps Lord. Yeah, so that small uh, cap. Maybe if you go back to Hosea the, chapter ten. Oh, chapter ten. Oh, okay. Maybe. This is a pretty long tirade that the Lord. At some point in Hosea, it says it's going to say like, "Thus saith the Lord," you know, and then he goes on for like three chapters or something. Okay. Um, but. Uh, so I, I don't have I don't uh, I don't have like the full context of this in front of me, but suffice it to say, this is Yahweh speaking, right? Um, sure, the God of the Old says, Testament, Yahweh. Let's go with this that. This is the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, the one God, Yahweh, speaking, and He says at the beginning of chapter eleven, "When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son." 
Now he's talking about his son, Israel, right? And calling him out of Egypt in the Exodus. But you go to the New Testament and in Matthew chapter two, you might even have a cross reference to this. It doesn't look um, like uh, it should have been because I know what you're referring to, but uh, let's see if it's a cross reference with Egypt. No, it is not. Well, this says Jesus Christ prophecies about. Uh, so there we go. Enough. At least it's Matthew chapter two, verse 15. Okay. Matthew two and finding it on the King James version on the church website, verse 15. And this is, of course, when Joseph and uh, Mary took Jesus away to Egypt. Right. And, and Matthew sees this as a prophecy right. fulfilled. Jesus being the fulfillment, Jesus being the true Israel. Yeah, the fulfillment of, of prophecy. Uh, <clears throat> and so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord, which would have been the Kyrios, the Greek, the, the Yahweh, spoken right. of the Lord by the prophet uh, Hosea, Hosea saying out of Egypt have I called my son and so again this is a reference to Christ to me the clear the clear inference here and and maybe this wasn't the best example I have like 20 or 30 more that I could have chosen and if I had had time to prep for this I would have picked one that was even clearer than this but um to me the clear inference is that God the father was calling his son his son God the son out of Egypt and who, who was it in the Old Testament that did that? It was Yahweh who called his son out of Egypt. And so here we have a passage where the New Testament writer has quoted an Old Testament passage and identified the father as the Old Testament Yahweh. Um, and, and like I said, I've got a whole list of these that we could go I mean, through if we, if we had time, um, we, we some of which will be clearer than others. Yeah, um, I, I think you've brought up an interesting point that I hadn't considered that. I mean, yeah, when we just list the four premises, and this is the, the interesting thing about these four logical premises that uh, make up the, the most basic understanding of the Trinity that's looking for some contradiction, is that, uh, again, for me as a Latter-day Saint, and the way I read the scriptures, I see in the scriptures this declaration of the Shema that there is one God. I see that. I understand it. And so um, I have to believe that. I, of course, believe that the, God, that the Father is God. Uh, and this is part of, you know, of course, the, the first article of faith uh, for the Latter-day Saint, for the Church of Jesus mm -hmm. Christ of Latter-day Saints, that we believe in God, the Eternal Father, which says right there, God is the Eternal Father, right? So there's that. And mm -hmm. in his Son, Jesus yeah. Christ, and in the Holy yeah. Ghost. I think as you read the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and all other scriptures, you see that Jesus Christ is God. So the third prince, uh, um, premise is accepted. And then also, it's very clear from interactions and everything that they're not the same person. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use your word for that. Um, and so I accept all four premises. And then when I say, okay, well, then they seem to contradict, you know, so <laughs> how do I reconcile them? Yeah. I say, well, I'm misunderstanding uh, the idea that one God means one, you know, go God person right. being, you know, that kind of thing. And, and so, yeah. Right. And all right. Which is why as you and I have had discussions before I we've, I've, I've come to a position where I say what, if I'm understanding, and I, I think I have a grasp on what your claims are about, the Trinity. And while mm -hmm. I, I struggle with this idea that the word being and the word person have to be given different definitions in order to make it work. And mm -hmm. anyway, I, 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 that's probably not the way you would say it, but I feel like for all practical purposes, the way I believe in God and in Jesus Christ, in God the Father, in Jesus Christ, in, in Yahweh, in Elohim, in, in all of the, the way I believe in all of these things for all practical purposes is incredibly similar to the way you believe in them. Now, I know you disagree with that, but that's what I see. And so I, I find myself standing up for Trinitarians in, uh, in church when someone comes along and says, the Trinity is such a stupid con uh, um, concept that's unintelligible. And I can present these four things to my neighbors mm -hmm. in uh, a gospel doctrine class and say, well, wait a minute, <laughs> we believe these four things and they sound contradictory, you know? Yeah. Anyway. 
Go ahead. What you're yeah, and, and you I, you pointed out to me in one of your uh, family discussions on this channel, uh, your father made a comment and you and you kind of uh, gently uh, corrected, you know, like, oh, well, that, that's not what Trinitarians believe. And I appreciated that. I appreciate whenever you do that. So um, I'm being asked if I want lunch. Yeah. Yeah, let's, we, we're going to wrap up here in a minute, I think. Yeah, let's go ahead and wrap up. We've got these uh, four the, principles. The, the, last, the last premise, and I, we yeah. probably don't have to go to the scriptures and read it because we've already discussed them. I would go to Jesus' baptism as a, as, a, as a clear indicator that they're not the same person. I would go to uh, the vision of Stephen seeing the, the Jesus on the right hand of God. Uh, I would go to the great intercessory prayer of John 17 and many other places in the Gospels where, where Jesus prays to the Father. Um, those I would take as positive, um, you know, uh, teaching, a positive scriptural basis for the fourth premise that the father and the son are not identical. Now, I don't like the way Osler, again, I don't like the way he phrases these. Um, I don't know that I would use the word identical um, in a definition of the Trinity. Um, uh, I wouldn't use the word individual. In the, in the first premise, he says uh, that... Uh, the one true God is exactly one divine individual. I don't know that I would use the word individual. And again, that's because of like the over a couple thousand years, we've kind of been honing, you know, the words that we use to talk about the Trinity. Um, and someone who comes into that conversation from outside and, and there's no way coming from outside, you could immediately pick there, up right? the, the, the Lord I would, Yahweh is one, one being and yeah. from a, an outsider's right. perspective, that's going to be the same as individual. Right. Right. No. And I don't, I don't fault Osler at all for the words he chooses. Um, and I don't know these, I don't even think he's wrong necessarily. Um, it's just, it's a difference of like, you know, I would try to use the more precise terminology that's been built up over, you know, centuries and centuries. Um, and that's something I want to get into later too. I, I do want to directly address because um, in the podcast in there's two or three places and I've pulled clips from the podcast. Uh, Osler says that this is just an outright contradiction. And I, I do want to get into why I don't think it's a contradiction, how I how I reconcile the apparent contradiction, you know. Um, so I have a lot more to say on this topic, but that I think that gets us uh, a good introduction, a good sort of foundation laid for uh, the rest of my comments, I think, about the podcast. So well, and, um, and I just that's wanna, probably as good a place as any to wrap up. Yeah, no, and I, I, I want to point ahead. out that, you know, we've, we've discussed the, the scriptures supporting each of these four premises. We've said uh, a couple different times now that I think, and I don't know that Osler pointed this out in his um, discussion, that, uh, I, again, I think, like, you, what he, <laughs> he found them in scripture. He put them in scripture in his, in his book, you say, right? He identified where these premises come from, right. scripture. We've identified them in scripture. Yep. I think yeah. that that if pushed and questioned, uh, a thinking Latter Day Saint is, and uh, there's your uh, any true Scotsman fallacy. Uh, any true Latter Day Saint no, no uh, Scotsman, will yeah. also agree to the idea that all four of these premises are supported by Scripture. So the the challenge of saying, see, so the Trinity's got this problem because now the Trinity has to resolve this contradiction is not a challenge just of the Trinity. It is also a challenge of Latter-day Saint theology because we too agree right. with these four things. And so what you're suggesting yeah. is tweaking the way that a couple of the premises are worded and defining the words in very specific ways gets you out of the contradiction, right? Um, Latter-day Saints will tend to tweak, I think, the idea that there is one individual God, just like you were, um, you know, a little bit balking at, and we'll say, no, there's one God, but what that word God means might be Godhead, you know, one overarching mm. godly unit directing all of the universe as a God, as a unified Godhead is what was meant by one God. That's one way they might tweak it. And another way they might tweak it is by saying that, uh, and I realized this as we were making that last discussion, that the Jesus is God, the God of the Old Testament. If you just assume for a moment that nearly everything, almost 100% of the time that the people of the earth were interacting with God in the Old Testament, they were interacting with God the Son, uh, perhaps from time to time who was speaking as God the Father, then mm -hmm. you have a way of the tweaking divine it. investiture. Yeah, exactly. That's what it's called from, uh, at least yeah. that's what Bruce R. McConkie called it. 
then you have this way right. of tweaking it, saying that Jesus is God, always has been, and uh, and and hold to that. And so, in the cases where uh, you're a little less leaning on God the Father is the one Jehovah, you're saying Jesus is the one who said, right. "I am Yahweh, the one God." But then you do get this question: Okay, then what's God the Father doing in there? And he is a, is he a second God? Is he above? the God Jehovah and you have, you still, we have to right. also resolve these contradictions. So, all right. Yeah. yeah. Is that a good place to stop? Well, so, and in, in a future video, I definitely want to say a lot more about that, but I think we've laid the right foundation. So uh, I'm satisfied uh, to close this one. So all right. thank well, you for letting me bounce all of this off of you. Thank you for your insightful questions. Um, you steered that conversation a few, in a few places I didn't mean for it to go, but they were good. I think it was important to, to cover all of that ground uh, in laying that foundation for the rest of my comments. So appreciate it. I think um, I was telling Steve we... uh, before we sat down to record this, I, I've tried to record these thoughts as a podcast uh, about three times and without being able to talk to someone else, um, I just bumbled my way through it and then I wasn't happy with it when it was over so I think this was the much better format for me to get these thoughts out so I, I appreciate I in a, you Steve in indulging me conversation we, you and I totally appreciate you joining me here and I, I love having these discussions and um, I, I think in the future conversation you want to address uh, some of these ideas about uh, whether or not most Christians actually occupy a space uh, lay Christians occupy a space of modalism um, and then also mm -hmm. Uh, what was the second area that that you wanted to hit uh, on? And we'll, I'm just sort of three main uh, criticisms uh, that Osler has of the position. Um, yeah, one of them is is Osler's uh, criticism is that uh, most Christians, when they try to describe the Trinity, they just end up describing modalism. Uh, I want to talk to that point a little. Uh, another criticism he has, and he says this multiple times, and, and even in the one of the clips I played today, he says it. Uh, that it's just a, it's a contradiction. It's a logical contradiction, you know. And so, and I want I want to kind of go deeper into why. But then also that if most Christians actually hold a space of faith in believing in in modalism, and uh, then uh, then the, and and if a firm understanding of the actual Trinity and and seeing modalism as a heresy is actually required for salvation, then unfortunately that means that most Christians are not. Uh, on their way to salvation because right. they believe the wrong thing. Most Christians have resolved that uh, contradiction by just uh, sort of sliding uh, backwards into modalism or one of the other views. Uh, and actually, well, I'll, this is spoiler alert for next next episode, but um, I, I'm going to push back on the idea that most people slide into modalism. I think they slide into all, all, all kinds of heresies and uh, Anyway, we'll, we'll go there in the next in the next discussion. But then the third thing I want to on is um, Osler has a real big problem with anyone who would say that you must believe in the Trinity in order to be saved. And he's Ratzinger, the Pope, and I don't care what Cardinal Ratzinger says, but there's plenty I can draw from my own tradition where yeah, I, I that if you don't believe in the Trinity, then you can't be saved. Um, and so I'll draw from my own tra tradition uh, and uh, and try to address that head on as well. You know, is that is it appropriate to believe that you have to believe in the Trinity or you can't be saved? Um, it, are people overstepping bounds when they make that claim, or is that is that something that Scripture teaches? Um, so, yeah, that's what you have to look forward to. Fantastic. Um, I know for a second there, um, there was a little bit of uh, connection that was cutting out. I don't know how that's ending up on YouTube. But uh, anyway, I really appreciate the time. And I'm looking forward to our next conversation, which uh, will hopefully be in just a couple days.